Good. So the floor is yours now. So shall I just start? Yeah. If our now is around, <laughs> I was supposed to, to introduce you. Yes. Uh, I am yeah. an actor. Yeah. <laughs> great. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay, great. So today we have uh, Michael Hay uh, presenting. He's a group leader at the Center of for Advanced System Understanding or CASUS in uh, in Germany. And he has a group on mathematical foundations. So Michael is a bachelor in physics, master in maths, and PhD in uh, maths as well by University of Leipzig. And he will be presenting today about polynomials and how to yeah, how to become your friends. Oh, that's already the next slide. <laughs> that uh, was awesome. now it's still a little technical issue. I'm sorry. No. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sorry. So thanks a lot for for the introduction. And of course, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here in, in beautiful Barcelona. And, and it's also my great pleasure to have such things sort of going on directly personal again. And I'm very happy about that. Um, yeah. And thanks for for the invitation and uh, from Arno and and uh, Alfonso and all the others. And um, yeah. So so let's go. So the, the original title of the, of the talk is uh, Global Non-Convex Optimization by Polynomial Model-Based Optimization, PMDO, for Tumor Response Models, which is quite long, and is actually the, the PhD thesis of Janina, who is a, a joint assistant here at uh, BSC. And um, so to make the title a bit more convenient, it's, uh, I suggested to, to, to call it to Make Polynomials to Be Your Friends. So, and before I go into that, which is a lot of meta, 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 math behind it, and I know that, uh, let's say, if I talk too much about math, then maybe the, the climate change here is not so well. So let's, let's skip it to a, to a minimum. And, um, but before I maybe briefly tell you where, where the Institute is. So, so we are a newly founded Institute, which was uh, officially founded 219 and get started operational by now a bit more than a year. And it's, uh, it's uh, located in the beautiful, nice town Görlitz, which is exactly at the border between Germany and Poland. So half of the city is German side, the other half is Polish side. And um, as you see, it's, it's somehow in the middle of uh, Prague, so Praha, uh, Leipzig, Dresden, uh, Wroclaw. And of course, its uh, mission is also to, to connect all these towns with universities and institutes and um, yeah, to be somehow um, a connector for, for these kinds of things. And uh, as Arno introduced, I, I have the pleasure to, to lead a research group there, which mostly looks at the math and the mathematical foundations of, of challenges, computational challenges we address. But it's not only theory we do, we also try to really, in the end, have open source software, which solves problems, which can you directly use for, for your problems. And of course, this visit here is also a bit an advertisement of, of maybe using these things for, for uh, the issues you try to, to, to treat. And that's why I will not only focus on this tumor response model, but also give you a bit an overview of uh, what we're actually doing in the lab. Okay, so as the, the name of CASOS, of course, suggests, so, so we are interested in, in understanding complex systems. And I mean, as far as I know, the BSC, of course, also is. So let's, let's try to uh, work maybe together to that. And here's a beautiful example from, from one of our partner institutes, the Max Planck Institute for Molecular and Biological uh, MPI CPG, I'm sorry. So for Molecular Biology and Genetics. And this is a very nice uh, stream you see here for the for the embryo development of the Drosophila fly. And of course, this is a very, very complex system with a lot of interactions going on on different scales here. Yeah? So on, on micro um, biology scales, biophysical scales, biochemistry scales. And of course, we would dream of, oh, this is the big mission of, of our partner institute, so the Max Planck Institute to have in the end really let's say, I can show it once again, it's so nice. 
um, a computer model, right? A, a digital twin that really could simulate the whole development of such an embryo from starting to that across different scales. And of course, this involves a lot of problems. I mean, as you can imagine, and I mean, it's a very ambitious aim. And my lab just tries to contribute to, to, to get a few of the, of the problems which occur there may be solved, get some steps out of the way. Let's, 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 let's see where we can go. Okay. All right, and, and to give you a, a short motivation or a short um, thing, I will come back to that a bit later on, is that we maybe make it a first kind of bit simpler, which is already complex enough, namely simulating um, single cells. And I will talk about that we can have a new um, technique, a new interpolation technique, which allows to describe such surfaces, which are somehow look like, like a blood cell or something, right? And then you, here on the right, see a simulation of a classic mathematical problem, so-called mean curvature flow, and um, which is a very important step to, to get these more complicated biophysical problems solved. All right, then we have with our colleagues uh, from, from the other partner institute, which is the HCDR, that's a big um, institute for, for radiation physics. And they, of course, want to understand, for instance, how electron densities, densities behave uh, for matter under extreme conditions. So where we, where we hot matter, and then you try to understand the, the quantum mechanics um, of this matter. And here you see on the right, uh, simulation a bit of these how these densities change over time and yeah so so we we contribute with uh Attila, which is uh, it's, uh the physics department in castles and then try to, to get some of these um simulations um become computable much better and this is for instance here what, what you see um, um a, a project from each student in the lab which is uh, one and this is a demonstration of of can, can we compute um, the, the underlying partial differential equations of such a system much more accurate and fast than other methods at the moment can do? And it seems that's the case. So, so we have developed a new method which we call a polynomial surrogate model. And on this polynomial surrogate model, you can model these equations and can solve them with very fast time. This is not parallelized or something just on a laptop with 10 to minus nine precision of a very high frequency signal. And this is, the, the, the problem here is um, the quantum harmonic oscillator, which is a special case of the Schrodinger equation, a classic benchmark case for physics. Um, and of course now one is extending this method for higher, this is a 2D problem for higher dimensions, nonlinear PDEs, more complex things and so on. But this was of course already somehow I would say breakthrough to, to be able to compute these things that nicely, that fast. Sure. We go. It's a, it's a, it's a linear one. It's a, it's a diffusion, the plus u plus a potential, which is usually x squared plus y squared times u equals f. And then you put in a high frequent f on the, on the right side. Or not, no, I'm sorry. This is the eigenvalue problem. So you know that for these type of equations, there are these Hermite polynomials. These are the eigenfunctions of that. And this is the eigenfunction for eigenvalue 31. Exactly. But if you if you are capable for, for getting the eigenfunctions till frequency uh, or till, till eigenvalue 31, this is already very, very much. So, I mean, yeah, so this is, of course, you cannot do all of them. I mean, if you, if you take uh, eigenvalue 100, then we are lost. Yes, but uh, I mean, to, to get 31 with that precision in this time is, I like it, um, yeah, all right. So, and now the, the of course, the, the project which was announced in the title is now in, in to, to, to maybe use these techniques also for another complex system, which is given by the tumor response model, which was developed here by Arno and Miguel and, uh, in Alfonso's lab. And here, of course, the big question is, can we with, with very few samples understand what's the optimal treatment for certain cancer growth, right? And because every, every question, is this a good one or a bad one? 
yeah, relies on, on, on computing the whole simulations. We don't want to do that that often. And so Janina's PhD thesis in, involves such um, global optimization solvers, which we, I mean, just extend the classic techniques from, from Bayesian optimization, combining with the polynomial approach we have here to get a new, or yeah, yeah, a new uh, global optimization solver, which in this case here at least, so the prototype solver uh, performs better than the, than the classic alternatives and finds a very good uh, combination of, of uh, frequency, um, dose and duration treatment in, in about 40 samples, while alternatives need much more. All right, so, um, before I go on on the on the applications, I maybe start with a bit theory. I mean, many many people who, who want to address such such complicated systems or complex systems, of course, also try to use machine learning methods. And um, and of course, they are very powerful, and they can treat high dimensional parameter spaces and, and learn on them and somehow give you surrogate models. And with that in hand. You can do something, you can look for solutions, you can try to, to, to understand something. And I just want to have a, a few aspects on the theory here. So the, the question is, can, can neural nets and machine learning approaches learn anything? And the first answer, which maybe people state or which comes into my, in, in mind is the universal approximation theory, which says that, that any continuous function from some higher dimensional domain, so this could be the parameter space, can be in principle approximated by such a neural net. So good so far, right? But there's a delicate issue which people sometimes forget. This does not guarantee that if you train a neural net on a certain training data, this gives you something which is close to the ground truth. These are completely two different things that, you, that such a thing exists and that you try to derive this good model by training a certain net with a certain architecture on a certain data. So I have no guarantee for that. Of course, what you can do is you can, as, as usually it's done, you, you have some test data and you validate whether it works well, but you have no mathematical theory that even if you would take more and more and more training data, you arrive at a close approximation. So the first are not exactly. Well, that's, but still, but still. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck. Mm -hmm. In worst case, you have billions of data, and you have many efforts to train the net, yeah, but it has nothing. It has nothing to do with the ground truth. Mm -hmm. so it's not something that you can asymptotically with with more and more data. Exactly. This is not. This is not what this universal approximation field one tells you. It just tells you there is some thing. And it helps you, in worst case, even this, this neural net has to be very, very, very large. And make don't, there are some, some theorems which, of course, make, make bounds on the architecture. But even those do not say, if you use now this architecture and you train the net, you will get something. It just says there is one net with this architecture. And for certain ways, it will be close. But how to derive these, these neural net weights, how to get them, there is no, no really guarantee or no scheme which tells you if I do this more and more and more and more often, then at least theoretically I will arrive. There's nothing like that. Okay. So, and then I want to relate it a bit to, to get a bit more insights in that. So, so there's a nice paper already, uh, I guess now 10 years old, which states that, that feed forward reload nets. So these are just the nets with activation function, such a reload function, right, are splines. Those splines is just I decompose the domain and get a local polynomial fitting. And of course, there are more fancy architectures than just taking reload nets, but I mean, this gives maybe some, some, something to treat that. And then there's a classic um, theorem from, from the Bohr and, and others which, which state about the approximation power of splines. And it tells you that uh, you get the polynomial approximation rate. So if you, if you decrease 
the, the size of the decomposition, make the resolution of the splines higher and higher and higher, you will arrive with a polynomial rate for getting the distance to the ground truth smaller and smaller and smaller. Splines? Splines is um, you decompose the domain. Locally, you fit a polynomial, let's say of degree three or five or linear to the ground truth. And then you have a penalty on the, on the boundaries mm -hmm. that should that you blew all them together nicely. And you can you can ask for I want to have them just continuous or I want to have them differentiable and and so, and this is a classic classic approach for for understanding data or or interpolating it. All right, now one could ask the same question for polynomials, and the answer seems to be somehow similar. There's an even older in this case universal approximation theorem, which is from from uh, Weierstrass, which tells you that any continuous function can be in principle be, be arbitrary close approximated by a polynomial. Very good. And again, we have here the problem that there is no guarantee that you that you if you just interpolate. So if you say I have samples, there's my data. And now I fit a polynomial, or more precisely, mathematically speaking, I really interpolate a polynomial, which is precisely at has the same values as my data to that. That this gives you anything which is close everywhere to your ground truth. So it's the same thing like training neural nets, does not guarantee that you arrive with something which is close, does not guarantee you that interpolation of polynomials is something close to the ground truth. So, but ha. Huh. So in, in based on, on, of course, previous works, we were able to, to, to prove a theorem that for a class of functions, I don't want to go into details, these are called classic Sobolev functions that are a bit more, more nice than just continuous, and have a very well mathematical structure. And all of them, you can theoretically get by a polynomial if you interpolate in certain good so-called unisolvent nodes. So here you have that what you want with increasing data, but the data has to have a certain structure, you will become arbitrarily close to your ground truth. All right, and then uh, even better, Nick Trefferton, who's the director of the Numerical Institute in, in Oxford, has, has proven that for a very broad class of functions, you even will have an exponential rate. So it will be very, very fast getting this ground truth. But of course, I mean, all these kind of, of interpolation or learning schemes have to somehow get around or, or resolve the so-called curse of dimensionality. So how much does the data I need scale if I increase the dimension of the parameter space? And the good answer here to that is that we can use a number of nodes which scales sub exponential with the dimension, while on the other hand having an exponential rate. So you have something which grows in complexity polynomially, but the, the, the rate is exponential fast. So this gives you in the end something which is efficient to a certain uh, to a certain extent. And maybe to, to get some insights in this, go, we shortly go to the blackboard. And um, here you see a classic interpolation task. So you have a certain function in 1D and you have the values of that. And you ask, can I somehow fit a polynomial or compute a polynomial out of that? And if you naively do that, you can, for instance, write a matrix there and you can have several approaches and this gives you cubic runtime and a lot of, of issues. But if you look back in what we know, then there was, of course, one of the most influential scientists of all times, which was uh, Isaac Newton. And he also did a lot of um, contributions to what we now today call uh, computational science. And there was uh, even another guy a bit later, which is um, Louis Lagrange. And if you combine the results which they already achieved, then you get an interpolation algorithm which works in linear time. Right, and the formula becomes of the first comes a bit different than maybe what you what you would expect, but it's harmless, and then you can can do that. And this is known since since ages. Um, and then maybe a short short thing to the Runge phenomena. So this is what I what I said. 
So there is, in principle, no guarantee that if you apply this algorithm, that this polynomial will be close to your to your function. It could, in principle, oscillate between the, the measurements of your the measures of your of your data arbitrarily far away. But what you can do is, if you take a certain well-structured data, which is called Chebyshev nodes, then you can avoid it. Then you know I will be close. Yeah, this reflects the theorem, which is stated that in principle we can approximate any function. Could we even sampling the point? Exactly. So equidistance, equidistance sampling is the worst you can do. Equidistance is the worst. So you need to. Equidistant is the worst you can do, and there are a lot of other nodes which are not equidistant, but are, they have a certain distribution and they are more located on the on the boundary of the domain, and they give you much better approximation than than equidistant sampling. And unfortunately, most most empirical scientists sample their data equidistantly, and then think yeah. they can do it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I mean it's not it's not desperately so I mean we, we, let's, let's let's see okay now these these uh, algorithms were all, I mean used for a lot of things till the 50s for for just computing things by hand yeah so this is this is a this is a high uh, supercomputing lab in the 50s, right? And I mean, many cha things change from the time. So I mean, nowadays we are better gender balanced and also uh, other things. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, it's really, these algorithms are very powerful because only with them you could already compute uh, how to fly to the moon more or less, right? So, okay, so let's let's just, uh, take them as a base and then we go ahead. And this is what we did. So we, we, we combined all these classic things one knows from approximation theory from this algorithmic side. And we developed a new algorithm, which now works in multi dimensions, not only in 1D, which generalizes these concepts. And um, my colleagues, and, and part of them are in the lab, they provided a, a, an open source Python implementation of that, which we maintain and, and continuously uh, further develop, um, which you can access uh, given there. And um, so we, we apply the whole software or the whole algorithms to, to PDE problems. And as I said, to finding good surrogate models, um, combining them also with machine learning approaches and then making some of the subroutines more feasible. Um, yeah, and many, 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 many things to that. So, and I won't go in the mathematical details here further. I just want to show you a few things we can do. Um, ah, no, sorry. First, maybe coming back to these rates. So how fast can we now use this algorithm to, to get certain functions um, approximated? And here's a classic benchmark, which is called the Runge function. And of course it's called for that, not for, for, for accident. It's exactly causing this Runge phenomenon, which I showed. So this oscillation around the ground. So everyone who says I have a good polynomial approximation scheme has to be able to tackle that function, right? And here's you, you see an example in, in dimension four. And the, the blue lines are certain spline approaches. And you have a logarithmic scale on, on, on the y-axis, which, which gives you the error. And as you see, they are, here, here you see these polynomial rates. Yeah? They are not exponential, they are just polynomial. And then there's a classic alternative, which, which gives you polynomial interpolation, which is tensorial interpolation, which makes more mess, makes products along the dimensions. The, rate, the, conversions the conversions rate, how fast do I reach a certain small error? And the red one is, is uh, our approach. And the nice thing is there is a, there's a theoretical optimal rate known in this case, which you can reach. And that's what we do. Um, I'll give you another another example here in dimension five. There in, in, in the box down in the, in the table, you see the the rates fitted compared. So the, the row MIP is the thing we, we have achieved, and the row is the theoretical predicted optimum. So we're really close to that. 
And now we also see the, what, what it does with the, with the number of nodes, so the number of data you need to, to get such a function interpolated. And of course, it's, it's much, much less than the, than the other approaches. I mean, this is just theory, this is classic numerics in that sense, but it shows that this algorithm is, is capable for, for being efficient, efficiently deriving surrogate models. It's sort of like that. Okay, so, and now we have several further developments of that. As I said, so, so most scientists, unfortunately, um, sample their data equidistantly. So, and I mean, you cannot do much about that. I mean, of course we can try to, to tell, please do this in another way, but usually, right, it's like that. And here you see just an, uh, a simple example where you have a multi-Gaussian, so, so something goes up, something goes down, which is somehow reflecting this, this quantum harmonic oscillator, yeah? this, this electron densities I, I showed in the beginning. And they are sampled on an equidistant grid. And now we have an adaptive regression algorithm which in the end merges all the subdomains on which we do a type of spline type interpolation but with a much higher order. And the algorithm finds how do I have to, to um, subdivide the domain, which degree of the polynomial I have to take, which is feasible and so on. And if you do that, then you can reach, let's say a 10 to the minus four approximation by needing, by, by, by just uh, requiring a factor of thousand less data. So instead of, of uh, storing the, the values of this multi-Gaussian on the whole grid, you just have to store the coefficients of the, of the polynomial. And if you divide both counts, then you come up with something more than possible. So which, uh, which, uh, it's just in this sense, still in, in, in a synthetic benchmark. But of course, you have Gaussian models. Um, yes, you have, if you, exactly, if you model something with, with several Gaussians and you can do that, but the question is, can I get a global polynomial out of your, your mixture Gaussian model, which I then can somehow posterior analyze better. All right. The other thing is that we do not only flat geometries, so here you see simple examples of classic um, algebraic varieties. Yes, so, so classic 2D surfaces, which are of course somehow important if you want to model biological systems. And we just sample a few points on, on, this, on these surfaces. And from that, we can reconstruct them somehow perfectly. And um, here's a real world data set now where you have maybe given this as a, as a certain mesh with a lot of points, right? And if we now, just look what is a polynomial representation of that. You just need a polynomial with about 200 coefficients, right? And we approximate this in, in an error from 10 to minus two, which is good enough for biology. And the aim of course now is to, to use these techniques to derive such simulations because now the, the, all the, the geometric quantities you have to compute like curvatures and even the Laplacian of curvatures and gradient fields and things like that. You can do this quite straightforward as long as you have the polynomial given. Of course, the approach also has, has certain limits. We cannot go beyond to more, much more complex services than that. Um, and this is what I forgot to include. So the, the limit is somehow given by the, by the famous Stanford bunny data set you may know. This is uh, in an uh, image and in computer vision, there's this Stanford bunny and, and one wants to, to test the algorithm to that and we get it reasonable close. All right, then coming back again a bit to this uh, PDE solver from, from one, right? You can, it's another example that it reached even uh, machine precision in, in just five seconds. Um, and you can do that even for, for signals which, which somehow seem to be more or less discontinuous, which have a certain jump. Which, which is occurring for, for shock waves, for instance. And um, even there, you get very, very good errors for this high frequency signal. Of course, this is 1D, which makes it a bit more simple. Um, but nevertheless, um, a, hard, uh, a hard challenge. And what one further did is now we, we, we want to, to understand the whole solution space. So depending on the parameter, which decides on how strictly I go from 
you know, how sharp is the transition of the signal, I get different kinds of solutions. And now I want to, to not only have a solver which can solve one solution, but I want to parameterize the whole space. So the whole, or any, any beta which controls this transition, I want to say, okay, that's the solution. And this works out quite well. All right, so yeah, this is a, there's a typo, should be D to the X squared. So this is a classic linear uh, Poisson uh, equation in 1D. Um, preliminary results also suggest to, to do this for um, nonlinear PDE. So there's a Burger equation, which is the, let's say the, the most simple special case of the Fenovia stops. And um, one is working on that and uh, results seems to point in the right direction. All right, now coming back to actually the, the, the topic of the, the talk is now that we use these polynomials to derive, so to give somehow a polynomial model of a Bayesian inferred distribution. So instead of modeling this Bayesian inference model, which you may know by Gaussians, as I showed you, so we, we derive a polynomial, which does somehow the same job. And then we just relate all these classic con concepts like compute invariances and expected values and then say, okay, you should go there and there and sample at this point because this seems to be most relevant. And the benefit to these classic methods is that once you have this polynomial, you can use classic or analytic gradient descents. You don't have to sample, you can really follow just the polynomial until you converge. And then you say, okay, this seems to be a good one, sample that. And what I discussed yesterday with, with, uh, with Arno is now, of course, this uh, tumor response model has, uh, was on, 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 a, on a big uh, a grid sample once. We did this experiment and then said, okay, let's, let's try to investigate how the model is working and have quite more data than just in, in, in this case where you may say, I want to derive the optimum in 40 or 50 samples. So you have much more data and now, of course, the the idea would be to use the algorithm to get a surrogate model of this model. And Damar, who's postdoc in, in the lab, he's uh, working on in this sense called model inference, which means in the end, I want to end up with the most simplest polynomial, which can assert my model, which is robust versus perturbations. And, um, and then I use this model to, to make correlation analysis to understand what's the variation, which dimensions to interact most. Do I have, like you, this is just an example, huh? do X and Z really have a strong correlation because they have X squared to, to, to Z to the four, at least that's in five is, is usable high coefficient, or do they don't have? So what are the linear terms, what are even higher order terms on which I have to take care? And then as, as in the case, what Juan has done here, you could ask if now the, the model in principle changes under certain external conditions, can we understand how the coefficients of this polynomial change? And then we would try to get a surrogate model of the whole range of parameters which the tumor response model um, gets. And in case this would work, it would be of course great because it can do all these, these analysis then much, much easier. So, with that, there's one last slide where we somehow did such a, such a similar thing already. This is here a case of a, of a mass spectroscopy data set, which uh, measured certain proteins called lipids. And depending on their structure, they get different signal. And of course, also depending on the device setting, this gives a, gave a different setting on, on, on and, and the intensity change of that. And the data set was unfortunately not very very nice, let's say. It was sparse and, and had a lot of issues. And we could not resolve all of them, but for, for a relatively broad class of these um, proteins, we could directly use MinterPy to interpolate such a 4D problem in this case. So there were four uh, variables on which the intensity depends. And we could uh, fit them quite, quite well. We even had the, the benefit that we smoothed out the data. So the, the original data here is the, is the orange one. And you have a bit outliers and a bit noise in there and the polynomial naturally something smooths the data out. 
And then on the left, you see just a, 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 a 2D illustration of that. So this seems to work quite well. And, and, and on top of that, we, we said to, to Kai, with which we uh, worked on that, I mean, it would be great if you could sample there and there and there even more. So we could give it somehow an experimental design and say, if you could maybe do the experiments like that, then we, we could compute it much better. So when you say the distant sampling is the worst, um, like you need to start from the distant and then advise where to sample more, or can you say, well, if I tell you how to sample, I imagine this would be the best way. Exactly. So, so I mean, we, we can propose you what would be ideal. But do you need first the existing sample? Or yeah, let's let's say so. So um, of course we we so if the if the sample is very high resolution, yeah, then we can still use this approach here, this multi regression approach here, here mm -hmm. to 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 give you something. But this this comes this comes with the cost that you need much data, and this comes with the cost that the algorithm becomes. To a certain extent, also costly, but I mean, still doable. Yeah, random, random is much better. <laughs> <laughs> Already, and, um, and random, like uniform random, or whatever random, but uh, not equidistant, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and and I mean, what of course. It's, it's not like you, you, you put the button and everything works, right? So, but, but you, you, you have to, of course, understand uh, a bit how the, the, the model is behaving. And um, what's, so, so with the first chat, one can try to, to figure that out a bit. What, what are the, the principal um, correlations, right? And then we can adapt even the nodes we know. If you see, okay, there's a big correlation in X, Y, and Z, and then you have two other variables, they are somehow easily and more or less independent of the others. Then we would give you a somehow very well uh, set of nodes, yeah, where, where we would ask you to, to please do the experiment again. And the good thing is it's, it's still re this regression scheme. So, so it, uh, you do not have to be directly on that, which you also would not be able to do with the saloon. Um, but if you're close to that, then everything becomes easier. Okay. With that, I would say I thank you a lot for, for the intention, of course, at least for, for questions. I'm, I'm here till, till Friday evening. So whenever you want to have a discussion, chat, just approach me. And um, thanks a lot. With that, I stop here. Sure. Uh, you're saying that the algorithm works worse when you increase the number of dimensions for the function set. So we have like a limit in what number of dimensions they show. And we, so we can be careful of the kind of works worse or comparable with the other methods. So, so, I mean, it depends on what, what the problem is. If you, if you, for instance, would ask, uh, can you make an image classifier with this algorithm? The answer would be no. At least not at the moment. And um, because if you if you look at a high resolution image, maybe let's make it simple, has thousand times thousand pixels. This is already one billion dimension of the parameter space. So, yeah, this is of course a very 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 machine learning methods have, have their power, right? Uh, we, we can do something. If you have something lower dimensional with relatively good resolution samples, like like I showed you examples of the from a response model or uh, the, um, a high resoluted signal in, in, in physics or something, then, then you have a good chance. The other thing is, of course, I mean, what you can do, so given, let's say, a bit higher dimensional problem at first place, which is hard to catch somehow, and you maybe use a machine learning or approach to get it, then you can still use this approach to make a surrogate of the surrogate. And try to, uh, to to get a bit light into this black box of the neural net, which somehow seems to work. But and the machine has learned something. But I mean, now I would like to learn something. 
and use that to, to, to make a bit variation analysis and then classic statistics, classic, classic correlation analysis in that. For this, no. But we use the algorithm to regularize neural nets. So we write yeah. different losses in addition for, for neural nets, which come from, from, from a certain subproblem, which has been just solved by the, by the polynomial uh, uh, model to give the neural net a hint, let's say, right? We have to go. This is what we do. This algorithm don't, doesn't need any, any regularization or anything. It's just deterministically and, and that's okay. I had a question on your the liquids the liquid slide. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very puzzled about but what is the best minimal set of sampling points? I mean, one of course once you have a minimal set, then you can you can you can say okay, we would go these other these other sample, right? I mean, yeah. and then you can go iterative, etc. This minimal set. Yeah. Um, how I mean, is there any way of having like I don't know board part estimate? Depending on the, I don't know, the internal complexity of the problem to know, okay, we need 100, we need 1000, we need 10. Um, the answer to that is, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so, because, because I guess in this case, uh, I mean, um, the, the people that did, yeah. uh, that did the, the, these, these experiments, yes. I mean, they already had like an initial set where you started. Right? Yeah, but I mean, this collaboration was. After they had the data, oh, okay. they asked us, "Can you can you do something?" And then okay. we tried, but all the experiments were already done at this time, okay. and there was no 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 chance to say, "Please, can you do that?" Yeah. And they started analyzing this for for having certain subfits where they just make cuts, right, and then had one dimensional interpolation task, or at most two, right, and then they did it local with some splines and things like that, and yeah, and then we we tried that and worked much better. And now, um, Kai is a postdoc of, of the Andrei Chevchenko lab, which is in the Max Planck Institute there with one of our partner institutes. He will probably leave by end of the year, um, but we will continue with collaborating with the lab from, from Andrei on such, such uh, questions and exactly what next time try to derive somehow such an experiment design at the beginning. But you always need something in the beginning. You need either that, that the, the the people who really understand this uh, know there is only a linear correlation or, met or quadratic or there is this. So we need a likelihood. And if you don't have it, then you can make a first shot of the data and try to infer that. And then from that say, okay, if you now would redo the experiment, this would be a, a better sample. I mean, yeah, you have to start somewhere. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, we do the same thing. It's the same idea. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. Yeah. Just, just, just. I mean, you could state it like that. So the, the classic Bayesian inference uses. Um, uh, Gaussian kernels as, as a surrogate. Yeah. And we use a polynomial as a surrogate. Mm -hmm. And I mean, given that you can come, that you can in principle approximate any function by a polynomial, why not approximating the Gaussian kernel by a polynomial? Mm -hmm. so this is in principle the idea. It's not that we do something new there, we just replace the representation of your posterior. And then we more or less do exactly the same thing. Of course, problems change a bit because you have to deal them differently and so on. And this is exactly what, what Janina is doing. And the answer why this works better, or here it works better. And as I discussed with Arno, this mostly relies on that, that some correlations in, in the tumor response model seems to be of low order, so linear or a bit more. And then of course, the polynomial can directly detect that and say, okay, here this, this is good enough to, to, to have a degree two fit to that or degree three, right? While, while of course, a, a Gaussian kernel thing has not such a concept. Mm -hmm. So I cannot understand this is linear. That just understands, okay, I need less kernels, but. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
We, we use exactly these techniques. We use we, so there are the, the, the polynomial model we assign to to the problem is not unique, and we use exactly these statistic tricks to to infer what is the best one. Exactly with, with computing expectation values and and variances and the same thing. We, we use a polynomial approximation of the if you want to say the density function of the distribution. Sure. I'm sorry. So nodes is the is the is the matters. There you have the data. Ah, okay. So I take samples. Samples, okay. if you want so. Okay. And I mean, yeah, it's a bit nodes. This is the ideal nodes. So nodes is where we would like to ask you to sample. Yeah, so it's a, yeah, that's it, it's just language. Yes, but there are interpolation nodes. So this one would be these perfect things they would try to have your function and on that, they need to have a certain structure. Otherwise the algorithm is not really working. Yeah. And the samples can be in principle Scattered, random, whatever, equidistant. Yeah. Also has some that, yeah, exactly. That's the idea. Exactly. So this is what when Nina is further developing to get this this algorithm solving such tasks. Yeah. Sure. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, there are two tasks. So, so in, in this case here, there is somehow a regression behind it. And this regression is weighted. Because here we say, if the polynomial model differs much on high values from the ground truth, mm -hmm. that doesn't matter. You want to have that it is close whenever the model becomes small. Mm -hmm. So it would be, you have such a function which maybe oscillates here, then goes down, goes up, oscillates here. It just would fit something with to this cone somehow, even if you have a big error on, on, on the on the other side, you would not care. And and what I said this is then here yeah, this last slide. This this model inference here you would then not do the or not you, you have to deal with that. What's what's the question? Do you really want to have the whole landscape very well described, or do you just want to have the the, the regions where it is small and and yeah. The, the nice thing in this case, as at least that I understood, is that the, the, at least the most relevant thing here uh, are three parameters. You have the frequency, the dose, and the duration. So it's only a three-dimensional problem, not like an image classifier, uh, one million, right? And even if you extend this, maybe to say, okay, now I have external things which make this model change for each change, I don't know. In physics, maybe you would change the temperature, then everything changes. Yeah, I don't know, you change another biological concept. It's not my expertise. And then, then the model would change. And then you could ask now, if you for a certain external setting have already a quite good model, you can expect the others look similar. Can I now just, instead of doing the whole thing again and again and again, just change the coefficients a bit, make them not constant, but depending on the external variables. 
and then get this range. So this is what I what I try to motivate it with that. Keep this keep the principal structure and then just change the coefficients accordingly. The degree would be more or less fixed. Yes, a little bit oversized for the symbols, simple cases in the new. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the experience is that what we have at the moment. I mean, it's simpler than that, right? So, it's just a a 1D problem, and then you have a parameter beta, and for each beta, you get another solution. All of them are somehow similar, but differ the more you change beta. And the hard thing here is that the transition becomes harder and harder, right? And then exactly we did that. So for each of these, for a for, for number of betas, we computed the solution. They all look how, how, somehow they are similar. And then we understand how the coefficients change. And once this is what you see then here. So you so in, in this tumor response, if you we would have to, to run this somehow for certain external variables. Yes, exactly. But it would split the problem in, in having it instead of six dimensions in total, it would get just a, a 3D problem and then several 3D problems again. We have questions from Daniel. Sure. Generalization. I don't know if you can do it live or. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, I was wondering how how good are the polynomial models at uh, generalization. So if there are risk of uh, overfitting the, uh, you know, the problem. Yeah, this is depends on what you understand of overfitting. If you if you ask how it's called interpolation, extrapolation is an ill posed problem regardless of which scheme you take. It has nothing to do with, with how you, you, if you say, this is my domain, mm -hmm. and now I want to ask, what's the value outside of this domain where I've never seen anything, then this is mathematically ill post. If you have no extra constraint, do not know something on the variances bounded, uh, things like that. So all these, these time series approaches and so on, they have assumptions inside that the things do not change too much. And then you can estimate how much can I extrapolate out of the domain where I had my training data. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can do the same thing here. The other question uh, addressing overfitting is that most engineers, I would say, uh, uh, have the experience that if I use a polynomial and I take the degree too high, then it becomes worse and worse and worse. And this is actually done because to to uh, to to mostly equidistant sampling, which is used. And this is exactly what what I showed. If you do that in the don't get me wrong, in the Latin sense, non naively, then this does not occur. Overfitting is just says you, you, you do it wrong, not the data is wrong or the, the, the approach is not solvable. Okay. So, like, for instance, like, just to, to go very practical, like the, the case of the um... The case of the of the proteins, not the, the um, yeah. this proteomics uh, uh, data that you have, like you find this one here. Yes, for instance. No, maybe yeah. the next slide. Maybe better the next slide. Yeah. Like uh, this case here. Like yeah. it, if you if you do a, another experiment, this will be we will follow this uh, this curve, like. Of course, so you said like if you don't have the data already, like it's difficult to to say. But uh, so like the, the question was more about like uh, what could be like strategies in this case for in order to you know to assess the generality of uh, of uh, uh, of this uh, function that you are uh, fitting. So, so like if I get the question wrong uh, right, uh, uh, I guess you ask again how can can we say already how you should do the experiment in, in best case right at first hand i think is this the question somehow yeah well more, more if you if you just like do another you repeated the experiment uh, and like uh, well, how confident would you be 
that, uh, that, that ah, the, okay. the, the, the data, the, the new data will follow this model. Yeah, I mean, here we, we, because we, we just did a, because we could not do more. We just did a classic uh, test experiment. Right? We just said, okay, okay we get 5% out of the data not seen from the methods. Okay. And can you, then we would reduce it. We produce it quite well. And what, what Damar, a postdoc, as I said, in the, in the lab is doing is, is he using classic statistic cross-checking and bootstrapping techniques to that. Mm. So you cycle over that. So if you have such a limited data set, you, you leave some data out, you look yeah, what's the, the error, the right? And then you cross-check, and in the end, you, you take the most robust model, mm -hmm. which has yeah a good fitting, but doesn't vary too much. And, yeah. and yeah. Yeah, exactly. And this is also like if you go back to the example of the when you show the mesh, um, and then uh, the, the the your model and, and then the simulation. No? Ah, the, the here. Yeah, the, that one. Yeah. Or oh, that one. Yeah. Uh, here. Here exactly. is one. Okay. Yeah. So here, for instance, like the, the number of coefficients that you are finding is two hundred sixty. No. Yeah. So, but this. Like this is because like you you have like a, a ground truth and you are comparing and this is like the the best that you can get no, but exactly. but you but I, I guess that you can also like uh, somehow reduce the resolution like having like maybe like a worse model, mm -hmm. but but again like uh, uh, going back again to this problem of when the new data will come how good this is going to to be you now okay. with respect to that. Exactly. What so, we here do, for instance, if you now would, would try to start a biophysical model in that, which would be more complicated than just this mean curvature flow, we would ask on, for each time step in principle for resampling. Yeah, because okay. if the curvature comes up, then in the regions where where curvature is very, very high, we would say you please give us a bit more data there or sample mm -hmm. on a certain right, or we would synthetically sample there and have a yeah. denser distribution there and a more easy somewhere else. Yeah, and okay. then yeah. So, so exactly. So, so making all these these things adaptively, and and uh, this is things we we're working on, and and we we hope to have the next beta release of the the, the Minterpy package uh, soon. Package. It will not include all the features I showed today because some of them are still in development, but some of them will be there. We also try to make a good documentation on them, with not only for computer scientists, which I would say in engineering perspective on mathematics try to, to assert it from 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 that point of view and um yeah so of course we are we are happy whoever has a look at it and then <laughs> yeah, better, better uh, yeah sure <laughs> and feel free to complain if something does not work or something <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you thank you michael thanks a lot sure Yes. Is it something that you can parallelize? Like, because you take your gradient and your polynomial, and you fix one to this point. But yeah. we like take the best and the second best, and the you know. I see. Yes. And the point, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I guess in principle, yes. At the moment, we we do so. The, it is always, of course, also of all this pandemic crisis. If there is one good thing that was that one postdoc, such and he was in quarantine and he didn't knew what to do, and he just made a made a prototype recoding of the of the core thing of that in C plus plus during that time. And uh, now, so it's not only in Python we also have a prototype in C plus plus. And then you can, but the other thing, I mean, this would be something one has to would 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 has to develop and um, and say, okay, uh, think of that. Yes, I kind of did. So, mm -hmm. Sure. The good thing is that the whole thing 
is, is that efficient? You can just give each port a MinterPy code. So the, the code is that good. You can just give each core of the of the HPC give the same MinterPy code. Each of them can compute it by its own. And then you just say, okay, this gets, this guy gets the second burst of this strategy. This one gets this strategy, and this one gets the other strategy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No more questions from the chat or people online. So, well, thank you very much, Mikhail, for thank you for having having yeah, given this, this presentation. And so we'll stay until tomorrow um, evening, I guess. Yes. Afternoon. Yes, afternoon. Yeah. So if anyone wants to talk to you, just come to the fourth floor of PSC and you can have a chat. Thank you all for attending and, and see you see you next seminar. Uh, yeah. Okay. Have a nice day and bye bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. bye, -bye.